Catechist, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1. continue our series on creation, and we have had a number of weeks of introduction, and I invite you to go to the YouTube page and look those up if you have missed the introductory remarks before, but this morning we begin with the days of creation, and so we will be reading verses 1 through 5 this morning. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Father, again, we just ask for your spirit to be our teacher this morning. Help us to understand all that you have communicated, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, a lot can happen in a week. The whole course of your life can change. In fact, an entire war was begun and fought and ended in only six days back in 1967. So a lot can happen in a week's time. But in Genesis chapter 1, we find the most monumental week of all time. The creation of the entire universe by God's direct hand. This first book of the Bible is appropriately called Genesis. Genesis means beginning. And in the book of Genesis, we find the beginning of everything. All the basic elements of life and the universe, including things like culture and society, all find their beginnings in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 1, 2, and 3 specifically, we find the origins of the universe matter, space, and time. We find the origin of the solar system, the earth, the moon, the planets. We find the origin of order and complexity. We find the origin of the atmosphere. We find the origin of life itself, how living systems arise. We find the origin of man, the most complex being in the universe. We find the origin of Marriage, man and woman in holy matrimony. And we find the origin of evil as well. All in the first three chapters. The rest of Genesis accounts for many other origins. The origin of government, the origins of language, culture, nations, religion, and even the nation of Israel. No other book of the Bible is quoted as frequently in the New Testament than the book of Genesis. And it is no wonder that unsaved man has his greatest objection and the most skepticism pointed toward what portion of Scripture, the early chapters of Genesis. But without Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we really cannot understand anything. It is the foundations of the universe and history and science and philosophy and religion and all of that. So if you remove Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you have a host of problems. The book of Genesis is structured around a repeated phrase. This is the generations of. Or another way to say it, this is the origins of. And you find sections regarding Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, and on and on through the patriarchs, but I draw your attention to chapter 2, verse 4, because the first section is not the generations of or the origins of a person, but it is, in chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made 
heaven and earth. This is the section of the origin of the universe itself. Describing the initial creation of everything in six days. And this morning we begin the exposition of these days. The days of creation are described in six literal days. And I know that is quite controversial. Many people don't believe that the days described in chapter 1 are actual days. But they are the kind of days that have an evening and a morning. Notice verse 5, evening and morning. Notice verse 8, evening and morning. Notice verse 13, evening and morning. Verse 19, evening and morning. Verse 23, evening and morning. Verse 31, evening and morning. Six days. The kind of day with a morning and an evening is a solar day, a 24-hour period. And we know this, of course, from the Sabbath regulation and the Sabbath command. Think about it. We understand what a year is. A year is our trip around the sun. A month chronicles the phases of the moon. A day is our rotation on its axis. Where does the week come from? What is the week? Well, it comes from the six days of creation, the seventh day God resting. Many different ideas have been suggested about the days of creation. Do they just mean long periods of time or something else? A good principle of Bible interpretation is to let the text mean what it says. Let it mean what it says, and only when it cannot be that do we look for things like figures of speech. For example, if the scripture says, the trees clap their hands, we understand the trees do not have hands. This must be a figure of speech. But it is quite a compelling argument to say, if God desired to communicate to us that this was six literal days of creation, what other way could he have said it? There are times in Scripture where the word day means an indefinite period of time. Like, for example, the day of the Lord is not an actual day. It is a period of time. But every single reference to a day in the Bible, when it is modified by a number, that means is when it says there were 40 days of rain. Or Jesus rose on the third day. Or when we have verse 5, one day. Every single reference in the Bible, when day is modified by a number, this many days, it means a literal day. And so we must see this as six literal days. And this morning we're going to look at day one, and it's a big day. The creation account is a fantastic example of symmetry the days go together. Days 1, 2, and 3 relate to days 4, 5, and 6. For example, on day 1, God creates light. But on day 4, he creates the sun and the moon to reflect light. Day 2, God creates the water and the seas. And day 5, he creates the sea life within the seas. On day 3, God makes dry land. On day 6, he populates it with animals and man. So the days exist in symmetry. In the first three days, God is creating the physical space. He is preparing it. He is getting it ready. And in days four, five, and six, he populates the earth with sea creatures and vegetation and fish and eventually mammals. There is an order to how God creates. But day one begins in chapter one, verse one. It's not just a summary of the creation. It is a description, a part of day one. It is the foundational verse of everything in the universe. It is the foundational verse of this chapter. And so it is the foundation of foundations. And so I don't think Henry Morris, the great Bible expositor, is exaggerating when he, exaggerating when he says, this is the most important verse in all the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens 
and the earth. Let's consider this verse for a moment here as we begin day one. In the beginning, it causes us to ask the beginning of what? Well, it's the answer is the beginning of everything. The beginning of the universe, the beginning of history itself. Before this, there was only God. The evolutionist will say that the universe began with nothing, and that would include God not existing. But the serious question they have to answer is, how does nothing turn into something? If there is nothing, then there is nothing. And I listened to some of the explanations for the account of the beginning through a naturalistic mindset, and you hear things like this. There was a tiny, dense fireball that exploded. That doesn't sound like nothing. That sounds like multiple things, including matter, heat, energy. Those are already there. They have to account for where those things came from. Listen to this explanation. This is from space.com, and I'm going to read it uh, in its entirety. But I want you to notice the assumption of things that already exist, and I want you to notice the statements of faith, as we discussed before in previous weeks. But listen carefully. The Big Bang Theory, this is quoting from Space.com, the Big Bang Theory is the leading explanation for how the universe began. Around 13.7 billion years ago, everything in the entire universe was condensed in an infinitely small singularity, a point of infinite denseness and heat. Suddenly, an explosive expansion began, ballooning our universe outwards faster than the speed of light. When cosmic inflation came to a sudden and still mysterious end, the more classic descriptions of the Big Bang took hold. A flood of matter and radiation known as reheating began, populating our universe with the stuff that we know today, particles, atoms, the things that would become stars and galaxies, and so on. Now that's the naturalistic explanation. There's a lot of things there that are already there, though, without any explanation for their origin. A singularity? Where did that come from? Heat? An explosion? Matter? There's an inherent problem. They say the universe began with nothing, but that's not true. You as well, you can see some of the statements of faith, the still mysterious end. That means we don't know. We're guessing. Stephen Hawking, one of the most respected and brilliant minds of science and physics, said this. This is his direct quote. I think the universe was spontaneously created out of nothing according to the laws of science. You already see the problem. The question is not, how could things turn into what they are today? The question is, if there was nothing, then why is there anything? If we started with nothing, then there should be nothing. And the universe was spontaneously created out of nothing according to the laws of science. You're saying the laws of science were already present. And I'm saying, where did those come from? If the laws of science were already present, then that is not nothing. We need some transcendent first cause with the ability to create. Otherwise, there would still be nothing. If you start with nothing, you will end with nothing. But there is a similarity in the explanations, isn't there? They trace the entire history back to a single point in time. Just like Scripture says in the beginning. Our initial point is God. Their initial point would be the universe itself. But in the beginning, did you know that the Bible records with pretty detailed specificity genealogies and chronologies of man. Those are the portions of Scripture we like to skip over, right? We don't necessarily like to read those. Those are very important, though. Because those genealogies, which Scripture actually goes all the way, all the way back to Adam himself. You can find that in multiple places in Scripture. And it lists people's ages, and it lists the, the reigns of kings and how long kings reigned. Then they're not absolutely perfect, 
but they are pretty specific. And if you added up all the genealogies, the ages of people, and all the time periods in the Bible, the reigns of kings and the years of silence and the time we have since the New Testament to today, if you added all of that up, it takes, back, it takes us back to 4,000 B.C. 4,000 B.C. As the time of Adam. Now I challenge you to go out there and Google where have we found the earliest recorded civilizations in history? Historians and archaeologists, when would be another good question. When have we found the earliest recorded civilizations in history? Guess when? Found in the Middle East, 4000 B.C. If humanity is millions and millions of years old, or, or hundreds of thousands of years old, or however it works, why do we not see that in history? Why are there no examples of civilization or culture before 4000 B.C.? It's because history coincides with Scripture exactly. This is the beginning in the beginning. We are introduced also to God, in the beginning, God. It's the name Elohim. Elohim is the name of God that stresses his majesty and his omnipotence. Notice the Bible makes no attempt to try to prove God's existence or tell you about that there is a God. It assumes it as if, as Psalm 14 says, only a fool would say that there is no God. Unlike time and space and matter, God is without beginning or end. God is eternal. That's why he doesn't say, in the beginning, God came about, or in the beginning, God was created. Just in the beginning, God. Romans 16, 26, he is the eternal God. Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Even in his covenant name, Yahweh, I am the eternal existing nature of God. And this eternal existing God, all-powerful God, created. He created. It's the Hebrew word bara. And it is only used in Scripture as the work of God. That means that God is always the subject of this verb. It is to create. It is to call into existence. Romans 4.17, he calls into being that which does not exist. We read it earlier in Hebrews 11.3, what is seen is not made out of the things that are seen. People, humans, we can make and form things, we can manipulate pre-existing materials, but we cannot create. Only God can bara. What did God create on day one? Well, that's the focus of our time this morning. Five foundational elements of creation that are created on day one. And these are very simple, but you'll understand they're very, very necessary for the existence of everything. And number one is this, time. The creation of time. Before the creation, there was no measurement of time and no passage of time. God created time. That's inherent to the statement in the beginning. Have you ever just thought about it? Like, what is time? Where does it come from? The sequential order of events that we understand our world in. We exist in time. We cannot help but think in terms of time. This happened, then that happened. We cannot comprehend a timeless existence. But time came into being at the beginning. As we said, God is eternal. God exists outside of time. He has no beginning or no end. At the beginning of the universe, God is just present. He's there. He exists eternally. It's part of his nature. But the heavens and the earth have a definite beginning. And time itself does as well. I know you may have heard the critic will say, okay, well, if everything has a beginning, what was God's beginning? 
If God created everything, who created God? And it sounds like a gotcha question, doesn't it? I have a pretty simple answer. No one. Because God was there at the beginning. He was already present. God exists outside of time. He's the eternal God, so he is transcendent. But the reality is you cannot have an infinite regress. Infinitely going back in time. So let's just say, for example, someone says, who created God? Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that something did create God. All that does is move the question back. Well, then who created that thing? And who created the thing before that? And the thing before that? And the thing before that? You can't go infinitely backwards. There has to be a first cause. There has to be a start. God is the creator in the beginning. And do not think that the evolutionist escapes the problem. They have the same problem. They will say, well, the beginning of the universe was 13 billion years ago, as we read, billions of years ago. Listen, do you know how long billions of years really is? It's really long. Listen, a billion seconds is 31 years. A billion days is 2.7 million years. That's astronomical. So now you see 13 billion years? You might as well say infinite. You might as well say an immeasurable amount of time. Just call it what it is, evolutionists. Just call it. Just say it's eternal. And what the evolutionist does is they take the attribute of eternality and they ascribe it to the universe. So they have the same problem of saying, well, I don't believe something is eternal. Yes, you do. You just call it the universe. But the eternality of the Godhead is seen in the creation of time. It makes me wonder about heaven. We read of that passage in Hebrews. They look forward to the city that is to come. Will heaven be in existence outside of time? Or will it be like a day and then the next day and the next day? Will it be a sequential order of events? Or will it just be a timeless number? <laughs> Even number would be wrong. A timeless existence. The creation of time itself is included in the phrase, in the beginning. That's when the clock began to run. That, there's your big bang. That's when God began the universe. The second foundational element is space. Space. That's inherent to the word there in verse 1. The heavens. The heavens. It's the Hebrew word shamayim, a plural noun. The heavens. And we're not talking about the stars or the sun. They're not created till day 4. This is space itself, friends. This is a, the physical location of the universe. That is the idea. Not just outer space, but a location itself. Physical dimensions and physical locations of the solar system. That is what God means by he created the heavens. What do we know or what do we theorize about the size of space or the size of the heavens? It's infinite. It's immeasurable. Only God could make such an astounding space as the heavens. God is, of course, omnipresent, but is, his throne is said to be in heaven. The divine heaven, the throne room of God, is located in a completely different place and dimension. There is no way that you can get in a spaceship and fly to God's heaven. There is no north, south, east, west that could take us there. That is just a completely different space. But our present space, the location in which we live, exists outside of God's heaven, and that is the space that is created on day one. The third foundational element is matter. Matter. Verse 1, the heavens and the earth. 
That's the idea there, the earth. Physical matter, mass, ground, land, dirt, the elements, the physical material. We'll see as we go through the days, the earth will be dramatically shaped in the coming days of creation, but this is just the basic materials of the substance of the earth. It would include, I believe, the shape of the earth, the crust of the earth. You see in verse 2, there are the waters. So just pause for a moment and consider what we have thus far. The foundational elements of the universe are beginning to come into existence. Time, space, matter. There's a fourth and fifth one to come in just a moment. But I want to address an idea that exists out there in Christianity. It's called the gap theory. And the gap theory is a theory that tries to unite evolutionary thought with the scripture's uh, description, the biblical description. And the idea is that God created everything on day one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He did that, and that was billions and billions of years ago. And then between verse one and verse two, there's a gap. And that's a really long gap. Where all of the geological ages are said to take place. Millions and billions of years of animal evolution, human evolution. All of that goes on for eons in between verses 1 and 2. And we are left with this cataclysmic state of verse 2. The earth is formless and void. And then what God does is he does the rest of creation. He kind of fixes everything really quickly. And that's what we have today. And so the gap theory is also called the ruin reconstruction theory. He makes it, he sort of lets it go, it's all, you know, not great, and kind of just there, and then he fixes it all real quick, quickly at the end. Evolutionists, of course, will reject the gap theory because they reject all of Genesis' account, but Christians should reject it as well. There's nothing in the text that leads to a gap between Genesis verse 1 and verse 2. In fact, the language will not allow for it because the language includes the, the Hebrew phrase, it's, a, it's called a vav consecutive, which means and, 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 and. It is consecutive chronological history. Every single verse of Genesis 1 begins with that vav consecutive. This happened, and then this, and then this, and then this. There is no way to allow for a gap of billions and billions of years. And as I've addressed before, the gap theory destroys many, many areas of Christian theology because you have millions of years of death and destruction and evolution and change before sin ever enters the picture, and that destroys Christian theology. The Bible says that death comes because of sin, not before sin. And that would leave God, if there was billions of years of death and formation and evolution, that would leave God the author of sin. That would leave God the author of death itself, and that would conflict with God's pronouncement at the end of creation that everything was good. We reject the gap theory. But what's happening in verse 2? It says the earth was formless and void. It's, it's uninhabited. It's unformed yet. It's unfinished. It's empty. The, the raw materials are there. Matter is there. It seems to be, the description is that matter is just sort of, all the elements, the physical elements are just submerged under the waters. It's not complete. And it says, darkness was over the surface of the deep, the waters of the oceans, the seas. God will separate the waters later, but we have no form, no creatures, no light, no motion. And this brings us to the fourth foundational element created on day one, energy. Energy. Because you have in verse 2, the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The third person of the Trinity present. He was moving over the waters. It's a very interesting word. It is the word shake or fluttered. And some give the translation vibrated. What the Holy Spirit is doing here is he is inputting energy into the universe itself. There is no evolutionist explanation for where energy comes from. We have the law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created or destroyed. It's only converted from one form to another. My question is, where does it originate from? 
Where does it come from? And you have to read these explanations very carefully. Energy has just always been there since the Big Bang. That's not an explanation. That is an assumption. That is a statement of faith. It is interesting that we define energy in terms of waves. We have light waves, heat waves, sound waves, and here is the Spirit of God vibrating over the surface of the waters. He is infusing energy into the creation, which again shows God's direct activity in all of the aspects of creation. God did not just throw it out there and then sit back and let it go. But we're still not finished with day one. There's one more element of creation. Number five, it is light. For the first time, we see how God did it. Verse three, then God said. God speaks. And things come into existence. He calls into being that which does not exist. This is the normal refrain throughout the text of Genesis 1. God says, let there be, and there was. He speaks it into existence. This is the power of God's word. Everything instantly accomplished by him speaking. It makes me think of Jesus in the Sea of Galilee calming the storm by doing what? Speaking. Jesus healed people's diseases by speaking. And he raised Lazarus from the dead by doing what? Speaking. It shows instantaneous creation, not long periods of time for things to take shape. God speaks, it appears. And it shows his sovereignty over everything in the entire universe. He created it, he made it, it belongs to him. And God speaks into existence light. Did you know one of the descriptions of God himself in scripture is that God is light. In 1 John 1, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God commands light to shine out of darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Without light, everything would be cold and dark. We need light. But what is light? We, we barely know what light is. Let alone, we don't have any explanation for how it came about. Light has characteristics of being particles and waves, which is unique. Because we say light has speed, the speed of light. That makes it a particle. But yet, light exists in waves, Light is not a color. It is a combination of all the colors in the visible spectrum. Everything we see is simply light rays bouncing off, reflecting off of objects. There are even spectra of light that are not visible. Like, for example, infrared light. Light has the ability to travel through a vacuum, like the vacuum of space. This is why you can see stars burning in the sky. But sound, sound waves cannot travel through a vacuum, which is why no one can hear you scream in space. Nothing in the universe travels faster than light, and modern, modern physics says if we could travel at light speed, time would be shorter. So this is really interesting. If you took a trip at light speed and your identical twin did not, when you came back, you would be younger. There are very few things more mysterious or fascinating than light itself, but without light, life is impossible. And you see why it's so important on day one of creation. Verse 4, God saw that the light was good. Yeah, he is the bearer of light. It emanates from his essence. Because friends, the sun is not made till day four. This is not the sun. This is light itself. And in Revelation 21, 23, don't get too attached to our sun. Because Revelation 21, 23 says, in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no need for the sun because God himself illuminates it. This is the idea here. 
God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and what did God do? He separated the light from the darkness. You're going to see a lot of that in the first three days of creation. God separates this from this, this from that. He doesn't remove the darkness, he separates it. There's a time of day where there is light, and there is a time of day when there is darkness. Verse 5, he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Quite an eventful day. You ever have one of those days where you say, you know, I really got a lot done today. This is day one. Time, space, matter, energy, and light. We believe that the Bible is complete. Scripture is complete. It is the fullest revelation of God to us. Everything we need to know and everything God wanted us to know is contained in the pages of Scripture. And the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, does not disappoint. Because it gives us the account of, the account of where these foundational matters of the universe come from. The evolutionist has no way to account for these. The evolutionist has to assume their existence. They assume their existence, and then they use them to try to disprove that God does not exist. We have the account of the origin of these materials right here. It makes you think, what else is going to come in the following days? And we'll see. But you need to trust the Scripture is complete. Scripture is the fullest revelation. Scripture covers everything, including the origin of these foundational aspects of the universe. And so we must build our lives on the foundation of the Scripture. Day one is in the books. And next week we'll look at day two and day three. Let's pray. God, we see your incredible power, your divine nature. Lord, these are the, the basics of life, the basics of our universe and existence. Without your direct creation, Lord, they would not exist. And Lord, your word says that we need to believe this by faith. So Lord, give us the faith to trust your word as being absolutely true, even in the account of the beginnings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.